between the carbon in chemistry and the negative impacts that's going to have on marine organisms, particularly calcifiers. <clears throat> and, and so what impact that is going to have on calcifiers is there's a wide range of responses, and Malcolm did a much better job about reviewing what's been out there in terms of the sensitivity of calcifying organisms, particularly coral, um, upregulating coral and non-upregulating uh, calcareous algae, to changes in saturation state. And so because of this, there's been a lot of interest in you know, changing water chemistry, changing carbonate chemistry in a controlled environment, seeing how it affects rates of calcification. And most people do kind of studies where they look at the present day uh, PCO2, past PCO2 in the last glacial maximum, pre-industrial in some future scenario, based upon some IPCC uh, projection. But the truth is when people are geochemists and chemical oceanographers going out to real rate environments, what we've known for a, a little while is that the PCO2 naturally changes by quite a bit, and this is because of the metabolic action of the reef itself. And so if you go out into different environments, and here I downloaded some data from the NOAA PMEL site, because they've got some previous uh, PCO2 buoys. Uh, one is from off Heron Island, the other one is in, inside Conyer Bay. And you can see that relative to atmospheric, which is this red line, the PCO2 can go up and down seasonally in the area based upon the kind of metabolism of the reef community. So we already have a very kind of variable environment. So Part of um, anticipating what the future impacts of rising levels of aqueous PCO2 are going to be in calcification is trying to separate the longer term trends from the natural variations and seasonal environmental high speeds. And so, what I want to mention here is, like I said, this goes back quite a ways. It starts with some of the early work of Steve Smith and Utah Atoll in 1973. And what he found is that um, <coughs> in that early work, you can actually look at the changes in chemistry and affirm rates of metabolism, things like production, respiration, and calcification. And this was kind of, this kind of thinking was pursued for quite a while. And they noted early on that, you know, on these three systems, because of the action of all the metabolic processes, you can get changes in the PCO2 on the order of 150 ppm. So the question is, what's driving those changes? We know they're happening, but we want to understand more about what's causing them. And so, a lot of these studies were done by just following drifters across the reef by measuring the change in carbon chemistry. And so by looking at the change in chemistry as, as the water parcel moves across the reef by protection for productions. And that's fairly useful, but what it doesn't do is it doesn't get at the underlying physics driving all the process. And I'm just going to get to that in a second because the underlying physics is a very key component of what's driving this. And so one of the things I started doing was taking a different approach. And actually before I get to this one, um, one of the things about the Lagrangian approach is if when you follow drifters, um, the drifters will move wherever the currents are going, and they'll move over whatever patchy reef community you're, you're particularly measuring. And so in that sense, you don't really have as much control. So one of the things that I tried to do is take a more Larian approach, which is you actually put out instruments in a known area, roughly a hectare of a reef community. And if you measure the flow dynamics through that reef community, you measure the changes in chemistry within that reef community, you can at least look at how that evolves over a course of time. Now, in the past, I've kind of given this as just like a governing equation, what they call the non-conservative transport equation. And what that means is transport means you're moving fluid. And non-conservative means you're talking about chemical species that react with things like oxygen, carbon dioxide, calcium, carbonate, nutrients, particles. And so they move across the reef community. And using this equation, you can kind of calculate what the <coughs> resulting rate of metabolism the flux of a particular element into and out of the reef bent is. But what I wanted to do is describe this kind of more in detail and explain what the physics is doing in this equation, kind of what it means conceptually. So basically what the bottom line is, is that from, from years of flow metabolism, what we've done in the field is realize that the rate of metabolism, whether it be calcification, reduction, respiration, nutrient uptake, <coughs> is a function of the change in chemistry and the hydrodynamics that are governing the movement of water across the reef system. More recently, what people have done is they've realized the rearrangement of that equation is that oh my god, the reef community is metabolizing the presence of the moving current, therefore it's changing the chemistry. And so what I'm trying to say is these fundamental relationships, all three of these things are important. You have to get the biology, the chemistry, and the physics right. <coughs> or let's just say if you get the biology, the chemistry, the physics, you can infer the chemistry. If you get the chemistry and the physics, you can infer the biology. <coughs> so what I want to do is take one particular section of that equation and describe it and just try to explain what, what these relationships are. And this is just basically a simple one-dimensional effective uh, transport, transport equation. And you have the flux is equal to velocity times depth times the gradient in your chemical species. And so this is pretty obvious um, from 
Fick's law is that obviously you've got to change the concentration of some reaction occurring, right? And the rate that you infer is directly proportional to the velocity and the depth of the water column. But I think a more intuitive way of actually thinking about this, at least in terms of how uh, Reese metabolism and hydrodynamics can affect the spatial and temporal variation in carbon chemistry is more the inverse, which is how does the chemistry change as a function of Reese metabolism and hydrodynamics. So if you look at this equation, the change in concentration of a particular species is proportional to the flux, right? Obviously you have stronger rates of metabolism, you have stronger changes in chemistry, times the distance or how much reef that water's had a chance to react with. And it's inversely related to the water velocity and the depth of the water column. And that kind of makes sense that if you have faster moving water, it's going to have less contact time with the reef community, it's going to have less change in chemistry. And the same thing with the depth. You make the water column deeper, you're diluting that metabolic signal over a deeper water column, it's going to get weaker changes in chemistry. So I'm sure this is pretty intuitive to you at this point. And my point is this equation is basically saying that, just with a few extra bells and whistles added to it. And so the point I wanted to make with this is that it kind of describes the link between the rates of metabolism, the changes in chemistry, and the physics that are going on. And one of the reasons people started looking into a lot of this community scale uh, metabolic work is that it's a way of kind of ground truthing the more uh, controlled mesocosm organism specific uh, experiments that are going on, which are extremely valuable and will continue to be very valuable for you know, decades to come. But it's great to actually go out in the field and see what a whole reef community or whole reef systems do. Because a lot of times, one of, I don't want to say a criticism, but one of the shortcomings is when you look at specific species of coral or specific species of algae is you're targeting, when you look at their sensitivity to some sort of stress, that's, that's true for that particular species. But what you'd actually like to do is go out into a real reef environment and see how a whole community of a lot of different species of algae and coral responding to the kind of changes we're expecting to occur in the coming decades. And so that's kind of one of the major motivations for doing some of this community and system scale work. Now, <clears throat> what I had done in the past with this stuff is, like I said, I put out um, instruments, physical instruments, light, temperature, currents, uh, changes in oxygen, changes in nutrients, alkalinity, et cetera, to for these rates of metabolism, and I would do it on a specific kind of reef area. And that's good when you can measure everything at the same point and, and have all those measurements, calculate your rates of metabolism, start looking at relationship between environmental parameters and things like nutrient fluxes, production, calcification, et cetera. But we have actually slightly better methods of doing this, and one of those we're kind of expanding into, actually, I'm sorry, before I go on uh, onto that, I should say I'm jumping a little bit ahead of myself, is that when we go back here, I wanted to mention in this equation, and maybe I didn't emphasize it enough, is that the hydrodynamics is just as important as the metabolism in terms of controlling the changes in chemistry. And so before I go on to the next step of what this was, I wanted to first describe that a lot of the currents in these shallow reef systems is dominated by wave uh, forces. So I'll, I'll explain it a bit. The changes in the waves as they occur, as they, they're coming from deep water, they shoal and they break. That process is what's driving most of the circulation in these coastal reef systems. And this is a plot from one of Ryan Lowe's papers um, that we worked uh, together on in Hawaii. And you can see there's an obvious relationship between current and, and RMS wave height. And that zero means just its deep water volume. And so the other thing I wanted to mention is that you can be really precise about making your chemical measurements and think that's going to tell you something about the metabolism or something about the changes in chemistry, but you have to be equally as careful about how you make your physical measurements. And so here's an example of changes in, in, in uh, cross reef flat velocities in two different environments. Conway Bay, these are measurements that I made. And this is more Ray and French Polynesian that Jim Hench made. And you can see they, up here they go from about, I don't know, from one centimeter a second to 25, 26 centimeters a second. And down here it's a reef crest, so it's a little bit faster, but it's going about 10 to, I think, 50 centimeters a second. And so the point is, is that you can make your precise chemical measurements, but if you don't know anything about the physics, then you're kind of just guessing. <coughs> and so I just wanted to point out that the water velocity in all these different reef environments, you can actually take instruments, put them on these reef environments, can vary by a factor of 10. So it's really important that when you're doing this kind of work, you actually are equally as uh, considered about the hydrodynamics as you are about the metabolism, as you are about the chemistry that you measure. So finally, what I want to get back to is what we're trying to do is we have more tools available to us now than we did maybe 10 or 20 years ago. And one of those tools that we like to explore now, at least I'm helping explore with Ryan Lowe and, and Jung and Zhang, is using numerical models. And what a numerical model does is it essentially takes an entire reef domain, a reef system, which I define being tens of kilometers, 
and it breaks it down into several hundred thousand or several million control lines, each about 25 or 50 meters big. And what you can do is you can apply this non-conservative um, transport equation to each of those little control lines. And then what you can do is you can drive it with a physical model which relates to changes in wave forcing for the response of the circulation of the system. And so this is a kind of a mock-up idealized reef that I made based on kind of using mean blue as a model. But it actually could describe a lot of different kind of coastal fringing slash barrier reef systems. And I don't want to mince words technically, but people often refer to Ningaloo Reef as a fringing reef, which from a large scale geomorphology kind of makes sense. From a hydrodynamics perspective, I'm not sure how much it makes sense because technically this is a barrier reef because there is a lagoon and there are reefs protecting the shoreline from waves. So I won't, I won't mince words about that. I'm just saying from a functional perspective, this seems to behave like a barrier reef system. And here's an example of what that means. And uh, Chris Fulton was alluding to this a little bit when he was discussing kind of wave disturbance and the distribution of uh, benthic algae. But on the left, you see a, basically an image of the depth, which I showed in the last plot, kind of three-dimensional. And on the right, you see I've taken one meter uh, waves at 12-second period and allowed them to propagate from the west directly onto the reef. And what you'll notice is that the, the waves come in and they show a little bit. They increase in height above their deep water height of one meter and then they break. And then behind, on the reef flat, the back reef flat in the lagoon is completely protected from the waves because once the waves are broken, the wave height becomes depth limited based upon the inter uh, internal mechanics of the waves. And you can see where you have channels here, you get some wave propagation through because it's a lot deeper here. But the thing I wanted to point out is that the back reefs and the lagoons behind the back reefs are very much protected from extreme wave force and disturbance. So these things are physically different environments than they are out the fore reef and in the channels. And so what is the result of that wave forcing? Well, one of the things that waves do when they move is they create what's known as a radiation stress. And that radiation stress is like a push on the water. So the waves are propagating from the water to push it. And what happens is when they break, the water behind it doesn't have any waves anymore to push back. And so how the, what happens is you get a response in the sea level, which is the water level in the lagoon and on the reef flat raises to balance the pushing of the waves. And so you can see here in this next plot, you actually have a surface sea elevation here, this eta, which is centimeters above mean sea level, down here at zero. And you can see a maximum increase in, in sea level right at, just behind the reef crest, right after the waves have broken. And that sea level elevation drives currents across the reef line and into the lagoon, and the lagoon itself is also setting up. And that's important because that dynamic is what allows the lagoon to drive, wa drive water flow from the lagoon and back out the channels. And here's the resulting circulation pattern you can get. Waves break, they drive flow across the reef crest, it ends up in the lagoon, and it comes out through the channel, and it tends to, um, because of the coalescence of the streamlines, you get an intensification of the currents of the channel, so that's why you actually get high water flow there. And so that's just kind of the basic wave-driven circulation pattern in a very simplified <coughs> idealized reef. And so what this means now, no, actually, not that, there we go. Maybe my help. So what you can do, is you can actually take kind of very typical relationships between light-driven net production and light-driven calcification, and you can actually put it into these numerical physical models. Like I said, you can put the chemistry back in. And then what you can actually start doing is looking at physically controlled changes in PCO2 and saturation state. And I should say physically controlled, I mean physical plus biology, because obviously if you don't have a reef there, you just have a piece of cement, there's going to be no changes in chemistry. <coughs> And so the one thing I wanted to point out here is it's going through its cycle. You can see as it goes through the morning and into the noon, you can see an uptake of CO2 and an increase in saturation state. And as it moves into the night, you get a release of CO2 and a decrease in saturation state. And so what I did is I did kind of a few simulations just kind of to show you how these relationships work. And one of the things I wanted to show is that here is basically the change in, in PCO2 as a function of day and night and also as a function of significant wave height. And you can see that as you increase the amount of significant wave height, you get stronger flushing of the reef system and you get a reduction in the magnitude of the, of the diurnal oscillations in PCO2. <coughs> Similarly, you can actually change these things by actually changing the morphology of the reef. And what I did in this situation, I took that basic bathymetry that I showed you and I made the channels deeper and wider. And by changing the channel area, you can actually have the same effect. By changing the geomorphology of the reef under the same forcing and the same rate of metabolism, 
you can actually change the diurnal variations in chemistry that we observe. So finally, to put this more in perspective, the idealized reef is kind of a great way to show how this concept works in a very blunt way. But we're actually doing similar things on a real reef system, particularly Coral Bay and, and Ningaloo Reef. And um, a couple other people have mentioned um, the system in general, but it's also, you have here, you have the reef flat, the kind of fringing barrier reef with a lagoon behind it, and channels here, up here, and there's probably one down to the south, which is off the map. And then basically we've been measuring changes in carbonate chemistry at different locations within the bay. And then what we know from just our measurements, just from straight measurements of, say, alkalinity, we know that the, the deviation in total alkalinity decreases as a function of wave height. And it also changes depending on where you are in the system, because obviously the more further removed you are from the ocean, the greater the changes in carbonate chemistry you're going to experience. So these changes are a function of wave forcing as they are a function of location within the system. And finally, just to show you how that all comes together, I should say one more thing, how it all comes together in our models, what we can do is we can do kind of a realistic model of what I just showed you, and we can actually plug in some of these relationships. And what we can do is we can simulate the change in alkalinity based upon measured rates of production, respiration, and calcification in relationship to light. And we can put that into our model, and we can actually compare what our model predicts based upon vari variations in real wind, wave, and tide forcing. And you can see, actually, we can do a pretty good job between this is what we measure under like, various points within the bay and various conditions of wave forcing. And this is actually what we simulate. So the modeling is doing a pretty good job. And this is one of the reasons we want to do this is that this allows us to get beyond just measuring all these things on a simple hectare. Because the physics, or I should say the, the numerics of modeling physical processes, wave transformation, circulation, are pretty well worked out at this point. So the idea of limiting ourselves to only um, locations and times where we can make current measurements isn't really that necessary. We have the tools where we can expand our view and start looking at longer spatial and temporal scales. And that way, what, what we'd like to do is, in this case, we've kind of done with known as forward modeling, where we're actually predicting the changes in alkalinity as a function of physical forcing, but what we really like to do, and I think the more powerful element of this, is actually to take physical models, take observations of carbon and chemistry, and back calculate what the insight rates of production and calcification are. Because that way you have a monitoring tool that wouldn't be limited to wherever you're actually physically located, you have a monitoring tool that you can actually do over very large uh, spatial and temporal scales. So. <coughs> There At this point, I'd like to just acknowledge uh, some of the support for this work, and some, in particular, Fraser McGregor and Mike Van Kulen Burdock, who you know, let us use their facilities up at Coral Bay to, to work out. So, thank you.